Marvel's Secret Invasion. One of the few universally disliked Marvel Cinematic Universe things. Could it have worked? Could a Secret Invasion story centered around Nick Fury told at this time in the Marvel Cinematic Universe have been a smart political spy thriller? Yeah, I think it could. And I've got a pitch for how. In my last video, I said that I'm not going to make one small change or rewrite videos anymore. It's a whole thing. Go watch that video if you want to know why. But at the end of the video, I said as a treat, because it took me so long to make that video and because everyone has been so patient, I will do one more rewrite. One more video where I take a movie or show or something like that and talk about how I would have done that differently. So in this video, I'm going to rewrite Marvel's Secret Invasion. And I just want to say before we start. I don't think I'm a better writer than the people who actually wrote Secret Invasion or worked on it. Seems like as a production, there was a little bit of trouble. I believe I read somewhere that one of the reasons they had to do reshoots was because of the Ukraine-Russia war that broke out and how that mirrored a plot line in Secret Invasion, so they wanted to change that. So all I'm saying is, I don't think the people that wrote the show are bad writers, and I don't think I'm smarter than them. This is just a fun exercise. As a fan of these characters, specifically as a fan of War Machine being a scroll, I do want to talk about how I think it could have been done differently. So if you will indulge me for one last time, let's rewrite a Marvel thing. And in the very likely event that you've not seen Secret Invasion, don't worry. I'll talk you through all the important stuff, and afterwards, you can go back and watch the parts that are good. And that's sort of the tragedy of this show, because going back and watching it again, there's a lot to like. Mostly the performances. Like, Gravik was not a top tier Marvel villain. But Kingsley ben really showed up. I love his speech with Gaia slash Fury in episode 6. It's very raw. You really feel this guy's pain, and it's a pain that's been building during the series, and hitting this emotional high really works. Until it turns out not to be Fury, and we never get this confrontation, and, you know, it's a little bit of a problem that we never see any of the things he's actually describing, or get any indication about them before episode 6. But just the performance. Loved it. Sam Jackson is one of the most charismatic actors on the planet. I would watch his Nick Fury read a phone book. Amelia Clark was doing good work. Don Cheadle was appropriately all over the place. Olivia Coleman was a riot. Charlene Woodard really brought the energy to match Jackson. And Ben Mendelsohn, I love him in this. He feels like such a real guy. So depressed, exhausted. Performances like this made this show. And it's why I wish the rest of the series came together as well as these performances did. The photography was solid, they used plenty of real locations, they used practical scroll masks and makeup. The action was fine, they weren't reinventing the wheel, but it wasn't that high level you expect from Marvel. And I think the scroll CGI was very good. I also enjoyed the costuming. And that theme was kinda cool. So many things about this show worked. Now I will say, I've heard people make the case that Secret Invasion should have been an entire phase, or at least an Avengers level movie, and in the abstract I agree. In the comics, Secret Invasion was an event that spanned many books and was felt throughout the Marvel Universe. And it's especially convenient because hey look, we've got a Captain Marvel movie on the horizon. This could be a Cap 3 is also Civil War type deal. Sure. And timing wise, this makes sense as an Avengers thing because we're about to establish a new team. Let's say the current terrestrial Avengers are Sam, Bucky, Shuri, Doctor Strange, Shang-Chi, Hulk or She-Hulk, Clint or Kate, Spider-Man, Spectrum, Yelena, Ant-Man, and the Wasp. Most of those characters have not met. Like if the original Avengers were all still alive and they had to do a secret invasion, that would be tricky, but at least they know each other. They have years of interactions that would help figure out whose behavior isn't quite right and suss out the hidden scrolls. But the current Avengers don't, so this would make things extra tough for them. And also, immediately after Thanos and before Kang ramps up, a secret invasion movie would be a refreshing change of pace. The Avengers would not be assembling to stop a single space tyrant with an ultimate weapon. You cannot punch your way out of a secret invasion. You need to think your way through it. And then some punching at the end. But that's not what this rewrite is. For these, I try to stay within the bounds of the original. I may add a few characters as cameos, but nothing crazy. It certainly seems like this show was pitched as Nick Fury works with his Skrull allies to stop a secret invasion, and that's what I'm going to go with. But feel free to comment that this should have been an Avengers movie. It helps engagement metrics or something. Like I said, I'm not going to add too many characters. I do have some cameos that would cost a bit of money, but apparently the series got completely reshot and ended up costing somewhere upwards of $200 million, so I think we could afford them. It'll make sense when you see the pitch. Also, most of the characters will end in roughly the same place they did in the show, most of them. And while I agree that a lot of these six episode shows could benefit from being eight or even ten episodes long, I'm going to stay with six for this rewrite. I'm not going to fully write out each episode, but I'll give you an idea of where each episode begins and ends. But before we get to that, let's talk about the big problem. 
There is a problem at the heart of a Secret Invasion series set in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. One that we were all aware of all the way back when the series was announced, but now that the show is over, it is clear that this problem was the series' biggest problem. It's the reason that very little actually happened. It's the reason that Nick Fury did not feel like an active part of the narrative. It's the reason the political thesis of the show was impossibly incoherent. That problem is this. In the comics that this series is very loosely based on, the Skrulls are almost exclusively evil. They have kidnapped and taken over the identities of beloved characters in an effort to rule Earth. Yes, there are a few Skrulls that we meet along the way who are not antagonistic, and some that eventually switch sides. but. Those are the outliers. Their behavior is unusual. The Skrull Empire might as well be a monolith. And in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Skrulls originally seem like the comic Skrulls. The Kree government characterizes Skrulls as invaders trying to infiltrate peaceful planets. The Kree have no other choice but to send teams like Star Force to attack the Skrulls before they can destroy the Kree way of life. But pretty quickly we learn that the Skrull Empire is nothing more than a small community of refugees trying to survive, and the Kree are actually xenophobic antagonists, who will not be satisfied until every last Skrull is exterminated. Carol leaves the Kree to protect the Skrulls, and joins the Skrulls on their quest to find a new homeworld, and that is the last we see of them, outside of a few appearances where it is clear that Talos, the Skrull leader, and his wife Soren are posing as Nick Fury and Maria Hill on Earth, while Fury is on a satellite running Saber, some sort of semi semi-government organization tasked with monitoring space. So in the nearly 30 years between the events of Captain Marvel and Secret Invasion, nothing changes. The Skrulls are still peaceful, they still work with Fury, and they are still presumably trying to find a new homeworld. The Kree are sort of all over the place in the MCU, and that's without even touching any of the stuff that happens in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that may or may not be canon. But just in the movies, Leaders of the Kree Empire had struck a peace treaty with the Xandarians, but it's unclear if they were becoming a more peaceful society generally, or just narrowing their focus so they could concentrate on their conflict with the Skrulls. You have to assume they aren't focusing heavily on the Skrulls since they know where the Skrulls used to be, Earth, and they have not returned since 97. You'd figure that's largely because they're afraid of Carol, but still, as far as we know, leading up to Secret Invasion, the Kree have not pursued any aggression towards the Skrulls. So how do you adapt a comic series where the Skrulls are evil and secretly invading Earth in a cinematic universe where they are all peaceful and working with the government of Earth? The answer Marvel's Secret Invasion chose was to ignore most of that history. Apparently there are not 20-ish Skrulls living on Earth, but a million, and they've been kidnapping powerful humans and replacing them with Skrull agents for some reason. And then Gravik, a Skrull intent on taking over Earth, is able to force an emergency vote that gives him control over the Skrull government. The entire terrestrial Skrull population, minus Talos and a couple of others, joins him. It is not until the operation begins to fail that they turn on Gravik. But in a world where Gravik is successful, the Skrulls would presumably have continued to follow Gravik and played the same role they played in the comics, a body snatching army of invaders intent on replacing and destabilizing our leadership and taking over Earth. And obviously, those ideas are in conflict. They cannot both be benevolent refugees working with Fury and also stealing people to create an army of Skrull secret agents working against Fury. The most important part of this kind of story is very clearly defining what the Skrulls are. Like what do they represent? What story are we trying to tell? I think Captain Marvel makes this pretty clear. They're refugees and specifically the victims of space xenophobia. Because they look different and have the ability to shapeshift, they are viewed as invaders and run out of any planet they can find. So what does this equate to in the real world? I mean, take your pick. This story is not unlike the many refugee crises currently going on around the world or the many of the past. You can pick pretty much any refugee group and find some aspect of their story in the story of Captain Marvel's Scrolls. And I only want to relate it to the real world refugee crises because it helps to show where we're starting and how bad some of the actual choices the show made are. Like for the sake of argument, Let's just describe some scenes from Secret Invasion, but instead of saying scrolls, we just say refugees. You can map it to any refugee crisis you want. Like it would be a wild move to make a show about refugees where the villain of the show was also a refugee, leading a secret army of refugees within the United States to do terrorist attacks. And it would be wild if the show's protagonist, the hero, had made a deal with the refugees to find them a new home 30 years ago and just stopped looking and now they work for him and he never gets in trouble for that or needs to apologize. And it would be wild if the refugees had snuck into the government and a high-ranking official was a refugee who was trying to start a war that would destroy the Earth. 
At one point, our hero gets mad at one of the refugees because there are more of them than he thought, and the refugee apologizes. And the series ends with the evil refugees being killed by our heroes, and because of that, the last part of the last episode is the president declaring war on the refugees. And don't tell me Nick Fury is not supposed to be the hero. Maybe comic Nick Fury is completely morally gray, but MCU Nick Fury is not. He is usually on the good guy side. Sometimes he makes mistakes, but he's always doing the right thing by the end of the movie. Like the last time he did anything genuinely morally questionable was when he built the helicarriers in Winter Soldier, but when he found out they were secretly controlled by Hydra, he helped to destroy them. MCU Nick Fury is a good guy. I know a big portion of this show is a reshot, and I don't know this for a fact, but I'm willing to bet almost all of the finale was part of those reshoots. The speech from Ritson where he designates all aliens living on Earth enemy combatants feels like the kind of thing you'd foreshadow a little bit earlier. Spend some time with him before this moment where he seems like he'll react badly if he finds out about the scrolls. The moment where Nick Fury knocks out a bunch of guards in the hospital without being on camera. Or all of this ADR in the conversation between Fury and Ritson. Or the ending where Fury casually drops peace talks between the scrolls and the Kree that have not been mentioned in the entire series. It just felt like so much of this ending didn't fit into the MCU or into the series we were watching. And it's wild when you think about it because if it is reshot, what were those reshots accomplishing? They are giving the Skrulls a reason to leave Earth and a place to go. Skrullos or any of the planets patrolled by the Kree Empire might be safe now, and Earth is hostile. Why do this? So we never need to see the Skrulls again. And that feels incongruous with the message of the show. Talos, the moral center of the series, believed the scrolls could be accepted, could become a part of society. If they did enough good deeds, they would earn our respect. Fury disagreed, Gaia disagreed, and obviously Gravik disagreed. And yeah, maybe Talos wasn't being realistic, but look at the X-Men comics. That's Xavier's usual position. And the comics maybe don't think he's perfect, but they tend to imagine a world where coexistence is possible. Senator Kelly doesn't fully win in the end. Sure, mutants are still hated and feared, but the comics go out of their way to show that everybody doesn't hate them. But this show chose an incredibly pessimistic message about immigration and refugees, also it could write the scrolls out of the MCU for good. Also, does anybody else feel like in the original script, President Ritson was actually just President Ross? Like it's been rumored for a while that Thaddeus Ross is set to be the president during the events of Captain America Brave New World, and Ritson seems to share all of Ross's beliefs. He's xenophobic, designates the scrolls enemy combatants even though one of them saved his life, he's white, his last name starts with R, and even though Fury says he's going to be a one-term president, it seems like in a post-Thanos world where Skrulls have infiltrated our government and media, an incumbent who survived an alien attack and runs on an anti-alien platform would be pretty popular. Throw in the fact that the original Ross actor died before production started and his replacement was busy with Indiana Jones 5 while Secret Invasion was filming, and it sure feels like Ross's name was changed but everything else stayed the same. So for the purposes of this rewrite, I'm just going to go with Ross. So I think at its core, Secret Invasion did not know what show it wanted to be. Because if it did, it feels like they would have made some different decisions. And because the show's philosophy was such a mess, Fury didn't work. He couldn't grow or change in any meaningful way because what could he possibly learn? Refugees are bad? Xenophobia is unbeatable? Or are we going to teach Fury a bunch of stuff he already knows? Trusting people is dangerous. Relationships are complicated. Sure, if the protagonist was someone else, like a new S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, this show could teach them that you can't trust anybody but yourself or something. But Fury already knows that. He wrote the book on that. And Fury could not outsmart any characters because nothing anyone was doing made any sense. Oh, could he trick the one secret scroll into revealing himself? Nah, he just bugged his phone and figured it out. Could he unravel Gravik's vast conspiracy? Nah, Gravik called Fury. He didn't really care if Fury found out. Also, Fury has everyone's phones bugged. And also, Gaia told him everything and Gravik didn't seem to care. And sure, Gravik shot Gaia, but then he just left her there. Like, hey Gravik, remember how you shot her and then left her in the road, and then you drove away the next morning using the same road and she was gone? That didn't set off any red flags? And none of this was a surprise to us. Gravik starts episode 3 explaining how he's going to do Super Scroll stuff. Rhodey acts like a completely different character, so his turn was super obvious. Like, sure, he's a little mean sometimes, but he's not dumb. Or at least not this dumb. So yeah, the philosophy and the logic of the show were holding Fury back from doing anything really interesting. So those are the problems. What would I have done differently? Well, let's look at my version of Secret Invasion. Although... <laughs> There's one thing I don't really think they could have swung, but would have been pretty cool if they pulled it off. 
and these days Marvel has been pretty leaky so I imagine this would have gotten out, but in a perfect world, this show would have been advertised as something besides Secret Invasion. Maybe just call it Nick Fury, have the plot super wrapped up, throw out some fake leaks about a personal mission or something that could involve Hydra and the blip, stuff we've seen done to death, stuff no one would get that excited about and no one would be that upset about missing. Like the show could still get people interested because Nick Fury, Sam Jackson, Scroll, and hey look, his friends Talos and Soren are in it too. It's not even that big of a deal. But like we're not pretending to introduce someone important like Doctor Doom and then pulling the rug out from under him saying, Ooh, gotcha, no Doctor Doom, it's actually Scrolls, we tricked you, hey, where are you going? But the show should have been advertised as Nick Fury and then only officially changed after the second episode airs to Nick Fury colon Secret Invasion. If you really want to mess with people, call it Nick Fury Serpent Society. If you don't remember, that was the joke title of Cap 3 before the Civil War reveal. And yes, the 10 fans of the Serpent Society will have their hopes dashed for a second time, but they've had it too good for too long. They need to be taken down a peg. Anyway, so the actual show. The first episode needs to start like a scene from any Avengers movie. Civil War did this very well. Have the new Avengers be fighting some enemy, maybe the Serpent Society or a version of the Lethal Legion. And this Avengers can be Sam Wilson, Captain America, Spectrum, Okoye, She-Hulk, War Machine, and Agent Everett Ross. And they're fighting in a government facility. Let's say the Lethal Legion is trying to steal some super weapon. So there are normal people around, but not very many. And this fight continues as these usually go until the Avengers stop the Lethal Legion and in the last moment, Agent Ross is shot by someone and just fully dies. Clear slow motion movie death. Okoye rushes to his side. Ross tells Okoye that he's sorry and then curtains. And Okoye cries over his body until she realizes something. All the Avengers come over and look until they see Ross transform. Okoye says, What the hell? Monica walks up and says, It's a scroll. Title card Secret Invasion. Then we get some chaos after the reveal as the Lethal Legion or whoever is rounded up by damage control in the background. You're saying Everett Ross is an alien. Kind of. Does that mean he was a mole sent to steal Wakanda's secrets? Not necessarily. For all we know, this scroll has only been Ross for a day. So the real Ross is still out there. I don't know. Maybe. Hold on. What the hell is a scroll? They're a race of shape-shifting aliens. And how do you know about them? I met a few of them, back in the 90s when Carol came back. You mean Captain Marvel? Sure. Who else knows about him? Just me, Carol, and Fury. Coulson and my mom were there too, but they're both dead. And when were you planning on telling us about this? I was hoping I'd never need to. Carol and Fury have been trying to find the Skrulls a new home for the last 30 years. They've been kicked off every planet they've been on. Can't imagine why. It's not their fault. The Kree tried to wipe them out because they were different. The Skrulls were the victims. We couldn't stand by. We've got to lock this down. The last thing we need is for the president to get wind of this and do something stupid. So what do you want to do? I can take the body to Bruce? No way. Ross keeps eyes on Banner. He'll find out. I can take the body to Wakanda. Sure, he will know what to do. But how do we know we can trust you? Or any of you? Any of us could be one of them. Okay, well, you're saying Fury knows about these guys already? Let's tell him and give him the body. Do you really trust Nick Fury? I trust him to keep a secret. Alright, well until I hear from him, consider the Avengers suspended. Last thing I need is one of you guys outed as a scroll on WHIH. So the Avengers go their separate ways. No more Avengers for the rest of the show, and we have a good reason why, or at least a good enough reason. So then Monica gets back in touch with Fury. Monica Rambo, been busy with your new super friends. Your mother would be proud. Fury, we need to talk. Let me guess. You recently learned a secret about our friend in the CIA? Is it looking a little different? How did you hear about that? I know you didn't just ask me how I found out a secret. We were keeping it locked up. Did one of the other scrolls tell you? And that's the part that scares me. No. They didn't know anything. I got this one myself. Picked up some chatter about a scroll named Demorak getting killed in the field. I assume that was Everett Ross. One other name came up. Gravik. Does that mean anything to you? No, but if you found out, that means the rest of the world isn't far behind. Give me a little credit. We need to get in touch with someone. Can you call Carol? She's out of range. I haven't heard from her in a while. It's for the best. She has a hard time being impartial about these things. What are you saying? The Skrulls didn't do this. This has to be a rogue agent. Maybe. Maybe not. But I've got to find out before there's a picture of our green friend on the front page of every paper underneath the headline, Secret Invasion. You have someone we can talk to? Not we. I. The smaller the circle, the better. Don't want to spook him. 
especially if he got word of this. You mean, I do. Have you talked to him since the funeral? Nothing to say. One of the reasons we work so well together. Do you even know if you can find him? I'm Nick Fury. If I can't find him, he's dead. So Fury tracks down Talos, they meet on a train like in the original show, do the whole tell me something I don't know monologue, and that ends with, so what don't I know? I know you're going to be mad, but you need to trust me. How many scrolls are there on Earth? Nobody knows. A lot. A lot for a cookout or a lot for Disney World? A lot. Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. We don't know. How the hell don't you know? We don't exactly have a sign-in sheet with everyone's names on it. We're trying to remain hidden. Best way to do that is make sure nobody knows where everyone is. I can't believe you would do this to me. To you? Yes, we were friends. I saved your life. Sure, you're my friend, but they're my people. And when word got out through the galaxy that Skrulls finally found a place that they could call home where we wouldn't be hunted, what do you think I'm gonna do? Sorry, my friend said you couldn't come. Good luck with the genocide, though. I'm sure you understand. And I'm sure you understand why I'm so pissed off. Price is protecting my people. So what are we supposed to do? I want you to meet with a couple of us. To show you that we don't mean you any harm. To get your trust back. I never trusted you. What? That's my superpower. I don't trust anybody. I'll meet your friends and I'll do whatever I can to keep this peaceful. But that's it. Fair enough. So have you reached out to... No. Are you sure? She might be able to... I said no. Alright, jeez. So how's your daughter, Gaia? She's at that age where she's making a lot of mistakes. But she's smart. Hopefully smart enough to stay out of trouble. I hope. One thing I do really want to keep from the first episode of Secret Invasion is all the Gaia stuff. That was good. She's working on helping the Skrulls get on their feet. This is incredibly useful for a few reasons. Shows us that she cares about this stuff, shows how some of it happens, and most importantly gives us a look at the Skrulls being sympathetic refugees. It's a great tone setter. We hear characters like the Avengers talk about how this might be some sort of invasion and by the end of the episode we see that the Skrulls don't have an army or anything like that. They're just people happy to find a home. This is also where we can first show Gravik. Give us a sense for his whole deal. Doesn't need to be much. Maybe even just him watching all of this. The Skrull Society. And you can tell he's uncomfortable. But perhaps Gaia comes up to him and talks to him very vaguely about whether he wants to quote do this or not. And he tells her that he doesn't have a choice. Other thing I think might be fun to do during this episode is check in with Sonya. She's the head of MI6. Olivia Coleman was a lot of fun in this show, so we'll keep the cheeky vibe, but very important, she is laser focused on Fury. It's clear that this is personal, although we don't know why yet. The last thing I would need in the first episode is a meeting between Fury and Maria Hill. They could do the sit down at the bar like in the original series, but this one is very different. Hill finds Fury waiting for her in a bar in whatever city Fury and Talos went to, says, I heard the news. What's your plan? Going dark. Fully dark. Why? Because once this starts, it won't stop. Of course it will. Fury, what are you saying? Saying this mission is the end. My end. I'm gonna lie to a lot of people. Burn every bridge. And it's necessary. But S.H.I.E.L.D. and Saber need a face they can trust. And you're ready. Consider this my resignation, effective at the end of the week. Fury reaches into his pocket and hands Maria Hill the Captain Marvel beeper. He slides it over to Hill. There are more official ways to reach her, but when she gets a call from this, she's gonna come extra fast. But wait, how... How do I know you're not a scroll? Yeah, that's the thing. They can perfectly replicate every detail down to the molecule. They can read your mind, relive your memories, learn your secrets. Hell, I know a guy who could tell everything about you by your scent, and they fooled him. So how do you know? I don't. Aren't you worried that I'm a scroll and I'm going to take this and toss it in the trash? Not really. Why not? Because I know something no one else seems to. Which is? They're just people. They're not invaders, they're not monsters. Most scrolls are just people. Normal, good people. And if they're impersonating you, that means they have your memories. They'll see everything you and I went through, and I think they'll do exactly what you would do. That's risking an awful lot. Yeah, well, I've made risky bets before and they paid off. Like one I made a long time ago on a marine who managed to piss off every member of her squad because she did the right thing. 
paid off big time. Fury checks his watch, realizes he has to go. Fury, this planet owes you so much. I know. That's why when this is done, if I make it out, I want to spend a little more time seeing her. Oh, and I got you one more thing. Fury hands Hill a small box. It goes with everything. Then they can hug or shake hands or whatever Maria Hill and Nick Fury do. And that's it. This is the goodbye this character deserved. Not getting essentially fridged to make Nick Fury sad. Maria Hill should succeed Nick Fury after this is all over. And that is the end of episode 1. So episode 2, Fury and Talos go to a secret scroll hideout and in walks Rhodey who turns back into a scroll. Get the hell out of here. Sorry Fury, you're a scroll. That's right. And where's the real Rhodey? He's dead. Cremated. Sitting on my mantle. You killed him? No. Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodes died in 2016 during your stupid superhero civil war. I think it was Vision who did it. Funny thing about it is, it's the best day of my life. I finally got a home. And when I think about it, I still get mad at Vision. Some residual memories, I guess. How did you take his place? It's complicated. Uncomplicated. Okay. Scrolls just don't exist. There are teams of us working behind the scenes to keep everything going. Relocating new scrolls, protecting the ones that are here, and making sure none of our people find themselves on the cover of the Daily Bugle. One team is the Gatherers, a group of scrolls who find identities for new arrivals. And where do they do that? Where do you think? The morgue. They work in hospitals as nurses, doctors, administrators. And they're good, some of the best doctors on the planet. But when a person comes in who they can't save, and they try as hard as they can, they contact one of us without an identity, and we take their place. Become that person. And if that person happens to be, say, an influential member of the armed forces and a part-time superhero, it's our job to use that position to make the Earth a better place for scrolls. Protect scrolls, keep us hidden, advocate for scroll rights when the time comes. And that's what you've been doing? Flying around with the Avengers? Hell yeah! If Thanos snaps half of all life out of existence, that includes scrolls. So what's your endgame? If everything goes well and we get enough scrolls in positions of public trust, acceptance. Maybe we can come out of the shadows in a way that doesn't get us all exterminated. But for now, we'll settle for survival. So what does that mean for us? Nothing. You keep doing your thing. We're not trying to replace humans. Says the person who literally replaced a human. We're not trying to replace living humans. We want a world where scrolls live alongside people in our own skin. And you think they're going to go for that. Not everyone, but enough. Hell, they let the Asgardians in and they're way more dangerous than us. Yeah, but they have a big leg up. They don't look like a bunch of little green men from outer space. It'll take time, but we're willing to work on it. And this Ross thing is a problem because well, we're not ready yet. And you're not ready for us. Not right after another alien just showed up and wiped out half of all life in the universe. And you're worried about the backlash. Ross got into office on an anti-alien platform. He's not just going to change face because we're green instead of purple. And if he declares war on scrolls, that's where things get really bad. This is Gravik. That's right. He's a fringe figure in the Skrull Council. Always wanted to conquer Earth, but the Skrulls are peaceful, so we just ignore him. But if we're threatened, he'll get more support. And it's only a matter of time before... Before what? Well, Skrulls are immune to most kinds of radiation, so... So he'd be willing to destroy Earth. Rather than see our species die? Yeah, I think he would. That's why we can't let it come to that. And how do you suggest we stop them? Well, first we need to stop Ross. Convince him that this war is going to end in destruction. And you think he'll listen? Last time I checked, he had a special distaste for green guys. That's why we need to get in front of it. If he finds out about Everett before we get to him, he's going to cook up all kinds of bad ideas. And I need to talk to the rest of the council. Make sure things don't get worse if Ross reacts badly. So that is our biggest change here. Skrull Rhodey is a good guy. And while Gravik is still an antagonist, he's not the only one. A big part of this threat comes from President Ross. And here, the Skrull's practice of replacing important people doesn't go against their otherwise peaceful nature. Instead of kidnapping and swapping people, they're taking the place of dead people, and some of them end up being strategically valuable. This is one of my biggest gripes with Secret Invasion. They've been kidnapping living Avengers, like War Machines, since 2016, and they haven't been doing anything with them. And as a group, they have no specific agenda. Like, they don't seem to have been preparing for an attack. Gravik might have been, but the Council wasn't on his side until the series started. So why do it? Why go through all the trouble of kidnapping and replacing one of the most famous people on Earth if you don't plan to take over? This is closer to the backstory we get from Fury's wife, Vera. She befriends someone on their deathbed and takes their place after they die. In this case, it wouldn't be with their permission, but it is painless. It lets the scrolls be as close to blameless as possible. And that mechanism could be abused by Gravik to create chaos and take control of the government, but it is not created with that purpose. 
Then we get the scroll meeting. Talos, Gravik, and a couple of other seemingly important scrolls meet. Gravik gives a big speech, then Talos is going to actively try to argue against it. Seeing them talk will help set up this philosophical conflict and turn it into something more nuanced than pro-secret invasion, anti-secret invasion. You've all heard the rumors. One of ours died in the field. Morat. A brave man. A hero. And a fool. You shut your mouth. I've kept my mouth shut for too long. You and Morad and so many that let us truly believe that eventually we would find home amongst the Terrans. A real home. Where we didn't need to hide behind faces that weren't our own. We've been here for around 30 years. Pick any border. Look at how they treat each other. Razor wire, guns, drones. And those are other Terrans. In our time here, nothing has convinced me that a better world is possible if we need to share it with them. There are good people, Gravik. And yes, right now... They're not the majority. But you forget, Earth is young. Humanity is barely 200,000 years old. They're like a child compared to the creator she are or any of the empires that have rejected us. We can change their minds. We can show them a better way. We just need to help those good people get into power and things will change. I'm sure there are good people, some of them. But the Terrans have gotten to a point where all it takes is one bad person and the whole thing burns down. We've tried your way, and it's gotten us far. I don't deny that. And I respect you, Talos. But I'm not ready to risk the survival of my species and the kindness of Terrans. What would you have us do? For starters, we need to take our fate into our own hands. No more waiting until someone dies to take their place. We need to pick a handful of key figures and replace them. And use them to protect our kind and weaken the Terrans. And once we can guarantee the safety of this planet, we strike. Claim part of the planet is new Skrullos. They'll never stop fighting. If I do my job right, it won't matter. We'll have so many moles in their ranks that they won't be able to tie their shoes without us knowing. And when they figure that out, it's over. They'll never trust each other. Never fully. Never enough to fight back. What about the Avengers? Captain Marvel, Doctor Strange. They're like three Hulks now. What happens when they fight back? we have got a plan for them too. Dr. Velmex and I are in the final stages of testing our new weapon. Project Titanius. That's foolish. You're going to make us the enemy. Mark my words. They will decide that before we fire a shot. And at the same time, Fury and Rhodey travel to Washington to meet with President Ross. I know what they are. And I heard about Everett. Fine man. Killed. All those things. How do you know about the scrolls? The government got some in the 90s and then we found another body in the 2000s. We always knew they might come back. Sir, we know you want to retaliate, but it's the wrong play. Why is that? Because there is division within their ranks, and a Skrull is gaining power who wants to start a war. Attacking the Skrulls will give them exactly what he wants. It will unite the Skrulls against us. Well, I've got something for him. What's that? Trask Industries is working on a Skrull detector. Once we find them all, then we get rid of them. We're not making a move until we know where they are. The last thing you want to do when you're looking ferocious is turn on the light. That's a stupid idea. Excuse me? Once the scrolls figure out what you're doing, it's game over. Even if you never manage to build the damn thing, just a mention of it is enough to start a war. Well, then we just have to hope I can get it built before they find out. President, you've got to listen. No, you've got to listen. Fury, I know this is personal. You've been close with them. Even used some of them as your spies. But things have changed. I'm an old man. I remember growing up hearing stories about Captain America and thinking, wow, the world sure is different. But we kept up. Fast forward, it's 2026, Norway is being taken over by Asgardians, and the Avengers are working with a goddamn talking raccoon. This is not a world people recognize. Not one where normal people feel safe. That's why they elected me. To protect them from these aliens. To bring order. Nothing is more of a threat to order than an army of body-snatching aliens. Even if they're not all bad. But they need our help. They aren't voters. Not legally, anyway. I can't believe- You can't believe what? Being awfully defensive, Colonel Rhodes. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you're one of them. You would question my loyalty? That's exactly what one of them would say. Alright guys, let's hold on. You know, I hear they bleed green. Ross pulls out a knife. Never seen it for myself. Jerry gets in the middle between Ross and Rhodey. This isn't helping. We need to defuse this conflict before it turns into all-out war. You're right. Just stay out of my way, Fury. And Rhodey, I've got my eye on you. Then as they're leaving, Fury can lament that that's his line. 
In this episode, we can also have the Sonya picks up Fury scene, and Sonya warns Fury that she's also been tracking the Skrulls and they should work together. Fury doesn't trust her for the usual reasons, but also remarks that there's something extra strange about her and he can't put his finger on it. She lets him go, leaving him with the transcript of Ross's call with Trask, informing him that they're going ahead with the testing the specimen is on its way. I'd also love for Fury to recognize a specific bottle of whiskey on her bar and mention that she used to hate this stuff. And Sonya remarks, people change. So those are the obstacles our heroes need to navigate to avert Skrull human war. Fury needs to sabotage the Skrull detector, and Talos needs to derail Project Titanius, which in the comics is the name of the first Super Skrull. I don't think they can call it the Super Skrull program in the MCU, it needs a more fancy name. Episode 3. So the third episode would be a double heist. On one side, Fury and Skrull Rhodey break into Trask HQ to steal the Skrull bodies. They figure if Trask does not have them, he won't be able to finish his detector. And for good measure, they're going to upload a virus onto Trask's systems. And then, Talos is going to reach out to Gaia to convince her to help him infiltrate Dr. Velmex's lab and figure out what Gravik is working on. Both heists go well until they don't. Brody gets captured by Trask, who has been expecting the Skrulls to try and infiltrate their facility. Fury escapes. Maybe this was even an elaborate trap set up by President Ross, who knew Trask needed a live subject to finish the device. And then Gaia betrays Talos. She's angry at Talos about what happened to her mom. We'll learn more about this peacekeeping mission that killed Soren. So then, Gravik is able to imprison Talos, which gives us a better look at Gravik's plan. So Fury is out of allies. Talos and Rhodey are gone. Everyone else might be a scroll. So with nowhere left to turn, Fury needs to get help from the one person he knows he cannot trust. By now, I bet you're wondering, hey, wasn't there another character in Secret Invasion? There was. Who could forget O.T. Fact Benley's character of Mason from Black Widow? He can be in here too, he can give someone a plane. But now of course I'm talking about the character of Vara, also known as Priscilla Davis, Nick Fury's secret wife. In the original Secret Invasion, she gets introduced at the end of episode 2. We never had any indication before she existed. Sure, Fury mentions a wife in Winter Soldier, but at the time, that seemed like more of a line he was using with Captain America that was supposed to act as a code. But no, apparently Fury has been married to a Skrull posing as a human woman this entire time, and like all great world building, it wasn't clear Fury originally knew she was a Skrull until the director told us on Twitter. Her role in this series was pretty confusing, honestly. Like, she existed to act as a medium between Fury and Rhodey. By reaching out to Rhodey, she inadvertently led Fury to Rhodey. But besides that, I can't figure out why she's on the show. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed Charlie Ann Woodard's performance, and in theory, Fury's Skrull wife is a fun idea, but I just do not think it was utilized incredibly well. So I'm going to change how she works a little bit. Here's her new backstory with Fury that we will cover in this episode, perhaps with flashbacks. Vara was one of the Skrulls who Carol saved during the events of Captain Marvel. She was raised during the kree Skrull War and served in the Skrull Army as a spy. She followed the remaining Skrulls to Earth and kept them safe until they met Marvell and eventually Carol. But instead of going with the rest of the Skrulls on their trip through the galaxy to find a new planet, Vara was separated from the group somehow and she got stuck on Earth. And she was completely alone. Her only link to her people was Nick Fury. But she didn't really even know if he could be trusted. So Vara used her shape-shifting abilities to get close to Nick Fury, took on the appearance of Priscilla, a doctor with a terminal illness like in the show, and joined S.H.I.E.L.D. as a medic. She worked her way up the ranks and befriended Fury in an attempt to tease out his true nature, but as they got closer, they fell in love. Fury and Priscilla dated and eventually got married, and they worked together in the field. We can see flashback adventures where they do cool spy stuff. Like, I remember a rumor that the Black Widow movie was going to be about her stopping Y2K, which was going to be a real disaster in-universe that S.H.I.E.L.D. averted. I don't know if that rumor was true, but that seemed like a fun premise for a movie. So we should see a flashback of them doing that. I realize now that kids don't know what Y2K is. It was the dumbest thing. Basically because the year numbers were going from 1999 to 2000, people thought that when the clock struck midnight, the computers would reset and send nukes. I don't know, people's entire jobs were to get computers ready for Y2K. It's what Office Space was about. Anyway, on that mission, Priscilla was shot and Fury learned that she was a scroll. Priscilla explained that she was not spying on Fury for the scrolls. She told Fury the whole story and he believed her, but that didn't change the fact that she lied to him. So she left. Fury let her go. Filed a report that she died in the field. And this is his new origin story. Nick Fury fell in love with someone. He let himself trust her, and that trust was betrayed. Fury would never trust again. But now Fury's desperate, and anybody who knows Fury knows Vara is the last person he would want to see. 
so Gravik would not prioritize her as a target. Vara also knows about the scrolls, how they work, physically and strategically. She's been keeping tabs on some of them. Remember, Vara is also a skilled spy who worked with Fury. Maybe Fury even learned some of his super spy skills from her. And even though she's not connected to them anymore, Vara still keeps an eye on things, make sure the scrolls stay out of trouble. So when she heard about Everett Ross, Vara put out the chatter that she knew Fury would find. And Fury knows where to find Vara. When Vara left, she told him where she would go, a home they looked at a long time ago in London. So he travels to London and the two team back up. And this is his personal journey for the back half of the season, working with his ex-wife and forgiving her and trusting her again. Because I think those parts of Secret Invasion were strong and we need more of them here. I just think a change in their dynamic would make the whole relationship more meaningful. And it turns out Farrah does have some information about Gravik's plan and clues Fury into Dr. Felmax's deal. He's a scroll mad scientist intent on creating a super scroll. Fury asks, how are you getting all this information? I have friends, just like you. You mean Sonya? Something like that. You know what's funny? I've known Sonya for decades, but I haven't seen her in years. One thing I can't forget, she's very picky about her liquor. And one bottle she absolutely hated found its way onto her bar. Fury picks up the same bottle from Vara's bar. She has good taste. What are you doing? What do you think? I think when you took her place, you needed something that reminded you of home. But since you did not have time to fully sim her, you didn't realize how much she hated it. Sometimes you gotta make quick decisions. She was killed in the field. Botched raid. She shouldn't have been anywhere near it, but you know, Sonya. And the man who would have succeeded her was an idiot. So I took her place. With her blessing. Var transforms into Sonya. I've been running MI6 ever since. I guess people can change. What about her family? Didn't have one. Anyone else? Only one other you've met. Vara transforms into O.T. Feng Bele's character, Mason. Captured and killed in the line of duty right around 2010. Also no family. You'd be surprised how common that is in our line of work. So what do you know? Gravik and Dr. Velmax are currently en route to buy some superpowers for Project Titanius from a figure known as the Power Broker. You know him. I know her. She's an old S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who got left behind by the system after the Sokovia Accords. He took over running crime in Madripoor. She deals in all kinds of enhanced contraband, bootleg versions of the super soldier serum, alien tech, whatever she can find. If you know who she is, why don't you do something about it? I wasn't worried about the super soldiers. I trusted Wilson and Barnes could take care of the Flag Smashers, which they did. Besides that, she's been pretty good at keeping order over there. If I get rid of her, some new clown would take her place, and I have a feeling they would be way more dangerous than little Sharon Carter. But if she steps out of line, like selling weapons of mass destruction to alien psychopaths? That's a different story. Do you think she knows? I don't. She might be a weapons dealer, but she's a weapons dealer from Earth. So you don't think she's a scroll? No, then why wouldn't she be working with them more directly? This is a last minute play, which means they're only involving her because they need to. She's human. So what do we do? We intercept the transfer, stop Gravik from getting his hands on whatever he's after, and if we're lucky, catch him can't warn her without risking her secret getting out. Besides, if she calls it off, Gravik can find other dealers. She's our best shot. So hey, how about the scrolls are working with the power broker? Let's tie into Tefatwas and have Sharon be the supplier of their powers. That's who she was talking to on the phone, Dr. Velmax. She's been acquiring the different biological samples that exist in damage control storage. But very important, Sharon is not a scroll. She's just a wheeler and dealer. She does not care who wants what for why. She's just in it for the money and the power. And Dr. Velmax is pretending to be a human to Sharon, not that she really cares what he's using it for, but Velmax knows that Sharon might have second thoughts if she knew this deal might end up leading to the extermination of the human race. Fury and Vara travel to Madripoor on one of Mason's planes. They talk about the old days, and we can see the part of their relationship that worked, understand why this couple made sense, and why it was good for Fury. Everyone gets to Madripoor, Fury and Vara watch from a distance, Sharon holds another meeting on the docks by the shipping containers from Tefatuas. We see everything the scrolls are getting, Cull Obsidian's arm, Groot Vines, an extremist soldier, Frost Beast parts, an Outrider corpse, a piece of Gargantos, Asgardian blood, and Carly Morgenthau's body. Gravik, Velmex, and a bunch of scrolls show up disguised as people to make the exchange. 
They're offering a ton of money. Sharon sends out one of her goons to act as the power broker. He can look a lot more like Curtis Jackson usually does in the comics. This power broker authorizes the exchange, takes the money, and his goons deliver the superpowers to Gravik. One of the goons trips, and as they're getting up, stabs a scroll through the leg. The scroll bleeds purple. The goon whips her hood off to reveal that they're Sharon Carter. She says, I knew it. Floodlights go on. The scrolls are surrounded. Gravik asks, what the hell is this? First I hear the news about Everett, and then this request comes through. The girl's gotta be a little suspicious. You knew. Government's known about scrolls for a while. It's a tight secret, but if you know where to look, you can find anything. So what now? Call your little Avenger friends and exterminate us? And spoil all this? No, I've been trying to pick up shapeshifting forever. Can you imagine what governments and companies will pay to get the ultimate spy? All I need is to open one of you up and figure out what makes you tick, and I will be able to reverse engineer the perfect camouflage. Now that doesn't mean I'm not going to take all of you. We can't be too careful. And a fight breaks out between the Skrulls and the Power Broker's goons. Power Broker's goons are way more prepared, but Skrulls have powers. They're super strong and durable. And maybe they even got a handful of fancy weapons, like Skrull stuff. I'd love to see Gravik get into it during this fight, basically have a Nightcrawler from X2 scene where he takes apart most of Sharon's goons one by one by beating them up, quickly transforming into the person he just beat up, and then running to the other goons repeating the process until they're all down. And Sharon watches, thrilled that she's going to eventually be able to sell this power. Sharon fights Gravik one on one and nearly wins. She's got all kinds of fancy weapons like the Widow's Bite and that one off repulsor glove from Civil War. Gravik gets the better of Sharon, nearly kills her, but Fury shoots Gravik through the shoulder with a sniper round. Gravik sees Fury. He's a little angry but also excited. He's been waiting for a face to face with Nick Fury for a long time. Gravik realizes this is the end for the Skrulls here, so they take what they can carry to their jet and detonate a bomb that they planted during the fight, which lets them get away. Sharon's team finds the body of a Skrull they killed, but Fury also manages to shoot that with a rocket launcher or something, destroying it. Sharon's pissed. So, the Skrulls got away with the first four things on the list. Cull Obsidian's arm, Groot's vines, an extremist soldier, and part of the Frost Beast. Enough to make a Super Skrull with some of the powers. It'll be tough to beat, but not, say, the MCU's version of Combo Man. And in the meantime, President Ross is ramping up his Skrull Detector program. Trask can finish designing the Skrull Detector, maybe with help from Riri, or maybe Amadeus Cho if you want to introduce that character. Riri makes the most sense to me since she invented the vibranium detector, why wouldn't she work on this? And if she did, this time Riri could have built in a failsafe in case her technology got into the wrong hands. Episode 6 So the finale would be split into two teams. The first would be Vara working with Riri to save Rhodey and shut the scroll detector program down. Riri would be especially receptive to the scroll plight after her Talokanil encounter. And now we have Riri and Rhodey, who in this universe is just going to be the Rhodey we're going with, in the same plot. So these two can work together and establish a dynamic that will be further explored in Armor Wars. And on the other side, Fury and Talos need to work together to stop Gravik, who is using the superpowers he was able to steal to turn into the Super Scroll. And this should come at the usual cost. If you give a Skrull superpowers, they lose their ability to shapeshift. So now it presents a very clear choice for the Skrulls to make. You can become warriors, or you can continue to live among the people, but not both. And the Skrulls really don't want to give up their shapeshifting, but if Skrull detectors become mainstream, what's the point? President Ross is giving them no choice. Gravik's plan is to attack the president using his superpowers to provoke a response from the government. Gravik also plans to kill Talos and leave his body at the scene so whoever comes and cleans up finds him and the news of the Skrulls gets out. Which means Fury needs to free Talos and they need to stop Gravik and protect the president. This all takes place at Trask Industries. Ross is coming in to see the new Skrull detector in action. That way all of our main characters are near each other for the finale. And like in the original, Talos sacrifices himself to save President Ross. Because that beat is great and totally worked in the original show, but they didn't do anything with it. Here it needs to inspire Fury and Gaia. So how do they beat Gravik? Well here's my version of the final fight. Fury is defending the President. Gravik is ripping up everything standing between him and the President, which means tanks, helicopters, all of it. And then Rhodey, Riri, and Vara escape the facility. Rhodey's suit is on the way, but it's far enough that he can't save everyone yet. They see footage on the security cameras of Gravik's attack and Radio Fury. What the hell is that? That's another Skrull who was able to give himself superpowers. Which ones? Gravik picks up and tosses a tank. A lot. Fury, what's going on down there? 
Talos is dead. Gravik is trying to kill the president and start a war. We need to stop him at all costs. Can you call on the Avengers? I'll put out the call, but I don't think any of them will get here in time. So you're just going to go down there and punch him? Leave the strategy to the adults. Fury, what powers does he have? Cull Obsidian Strength, Groot's Elasticity, Extremist Fire, and Frost Beast Ice Breath. Got any bright ideas? Extremists. I remember that one. Old Rhodey fought those guys. Do you know if it was from the original Mandarin attack? Why? Because if it's the original recipe, they had a short shelf life. If you worked him up enough, they'd explode. So if you do enough damage, we can overload him. That means... Yeah, I'm gonna go down there and punch him. Fury, you need to give me some time. My suit's on the way, but it's not here yet. We need a distraction. Fury thinks. All right, get here as quickly as you can. I'm gonna try something new. Fury walks onto the battlefield. Gravik. Gravik stops the destruction and listens to Fury. Nick Fury. Well, this better be good. Gravik, before you start a war that will destroy the human race, I want to say something. What's that? I'm sorry. Gravik pauses. I told you I would find you a home. But I was scared to face the truth. You were home. I've seen aliens cause wars, level cities. Earth was almost destroyed by the Kree Empire all because you were here. And I was playing the Kree's game. Because I thought getting you off the world was the best way to protect our people. And sure, that may be the safe way to play it. But that's not what we do. Because you are our people. Just didn't see that until now. Talos died proving that you deserve a home here just as much as we do. If you back down and let Ross live, we can figure something out. Talos was weak. Skrulls cannot coexist with humans. The only way forward is with your destruction. Gravik calls the Skrull forces behind him, but Gaia, their new leader, orders him to stand down. And they listen. It's over, Gravik. This won't be over until every last human is in the ground, and I will kill you all myself, starting with Ross. Where did he go? Gravik looks around, and then we hear behind Gravik, you looking for this? Brody throws the tank onto Gravik. Gravik bursts out the tank and fights Rhodey. Fury tells all the soldiers to concentrate their fire on Gravik. Gaia does the same for the scrolls. Gravik keeps fighting and heats up. Rhodey throws everything at Gravik as Gravik turns bright red. Rhodey picks up Gravik and flies into the air. And a second later, Gravik explodes. Then Rhodey comes falling down to Earth. Now I'm three ways about this next part. Either we have Jen show up and catch Rhodey as a little throwback to Avengers 1, or we have Sam show up and catch Rhodey, just like he tried to do in Civil War, or before Rhodey hits the ground, a parachute deploys, because of course he would have one of those by now. Either way, he survives. You can wrap some of these things up. Rhodey goes back to being Rhodey. Gaia becomes the Skrull's new leader. And I think this series needs to end with a confrontation with Ross. Fury can call Ross right before Ross gives a speech about the attack. Nick Fury. President. And lucky you're not behind bars. Always have been. What do you want? I know you're about to declare war against the Skrulls. Call it off. They tried to kill me. One of them tried to kill you. That doesn't mean all of them are going to do the same thing. I'm not going to just sit by while these aliens invade Earth. There need to be consequences. You're right. Amnesty. Are you out of your damn mind? Amnesty for the Skrulls on Earth. We give them irradiated land to live on. Russia has some to spare. And then we pledge to help protect them. And why the hell would I do that? Because it's the right thing to do. And also, I have footage of one of them saving your life and dying because of it. If it comes out that the president who declared war on scrolls was saved by one or maybe even working with them, I don't know, that sounds like some one-term behavior. If I ever find you, don't worry, you won't. Fury hangs up. We can see a news report that the Skrulls have been offered amnesty. Fury and Vara leave, possibly never to be seen again in the MCU, so long-term consequences. Rhodey is a Skrull forever. The old Rhodey is dead, but the Skrull Rhodey is now a good guy. Also, Everett Ross is just forever dead. I think that's fine. The character served a purpose, but besides eating up some Wakanda Forever runtime, I don't know what he's there for now. So, he can go. Gaia is the new leader of the Skrulls who are able to remain on Earth, and Fury is going to travel the world and shift his efforts from finding the Skrulls a new home to getting this planet to finally accept them. Because I think that's the big mistake he makes in this series. Nobody wants the Skrulls, and they're here, and Fury is a master manipulator, but for whatever reason, Fury doesn't try to get the Skrulls accepted on Earth. After all, this is an Earth where Asgardians and Light Elves are just running around. Aliens are not that unusual. 
and there has to be some reason why Fury didn't try. Maybe he does harbor a little weirdness. After all, the squirrels were the first truly strange thing Fury encountered. So maybe he just does not think they can fit on Earth. But Talos' sacrifice proves that it's worth trying, so Fury sticks it out. That's his arc. Fury starts the series unsuccessfully trying to get rid of the scrolls and ends the series accepting that they're here and helping them become accepted as part of our society. Also, little bonus, President Ross was attacked. Regardless of how much of this actually gets out to the public, they know he was defenseless. So maybe this is the moment he decides to go full Red Hulk. Get some Hulk blood from the She-Hulk nerds and we can deal with the fallout of that in Brave New World. So yeah, that's my secret invasion pitch. What am I doing right now, you ask? Well, I'm on the set of my next video where I cast Booster Gold, the greatest hero you've never heard of. And yeah, that video will be on YouTube eventually, maybe in like a month or something like that. But if you want to watch it right now, you can find it on this video's sponsor, Nebula. And that's right, Nebula is a fantastic subscription streaming service that I helped to create. Every single one of my videos goes up there early and ad free. You can watch them before anyone else. You can know who to get angry at me for not picking as Booster Gold right now. It's a fantastic way to support creators. So many creators you already watch are already on Nebula. We're working on so many cool Nebula originals, stuff I'm sure you've heard about, stuff you probably haven't, and I'm very excited for all of you to see all of that. And Nebula on its own is $5 a month. It's a great deal, but if you use the code NANDO, you can get it for just under $2.50 a month. So go to go.nebula.tv slash Nando, sign up for Nebula, watch this video, and let me know what you thought of my booster gold. As always, huge thanks to everybody that continues to support the channel on Patreon, everybody that watches these videos early and ad-free on Nebula, everybody listens to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking, and everybody that follows me on Twitch, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff, I'm Nando V Movies on all those platforms. That's all I got. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.